But don't go anywhere yet, ladies and gentlemen. We are going to start again. Welcome to our regular council meeting for July 7th. I'll call it to order. First up is the adoption of our minutes from the public hearing held June 16th, 2014. Do we have a mover? Moved by Councillor Lefebvre, seconded by Councillor Greer. And are there any errors or omissions in those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. I now need a mover and a seconder for adopting the minutes of the Committee of the Whole meeting held June 16, 2014. Moved by Councillor Powell, seconded by Councillor Powell Davidson. Any errors or omissions in those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Now I need a mover and a seconder that the minutes of the Council meeting held June 16, 2014 be adopted. Moved by Council of Fave, seconded by Councilor Morrison. Again, any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And those are carried as well. We're now moving to our approval of the agenda. I do have uh, a change tonight. I'm looking for a, a motion that the agenda item 6J regarding the unsightly property located at 222 Corfield Street be removed and that the July 7th, 2014 Council meeting agenda be approved as amended. Moved by Councillor Powell, seconded by Councillor Powell Davidson, so I presume, of course, that item has been dealt with already, hence it's no longer required. Any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried, so our agenda is now approved as amended. So please note 6J is off. Now, we have one presentation this evening, ladies and gentlemen, and this is from the Aerosmith Search and Rescue Long-Term Service Award. So, uh, do we have the Aerosmith Search and Rescue folks here? I don't see them. Okay, so we'll just maybe put a hold on that for now. We'll carry on, and if they arrive during the delegations, we can get that done. Moving into delegations, ladies and gentlemen, we have three delegations tonight. Uh, one of them obviously is not in attendance, so we're going to jump to delegation number two, and that's from the Orange Bridge Merchants, and it's the update on beautification of the Orange Bridge Gateway. So I see some activity there if you want to come forward, and uh, I think you know how this works. Have a seat. I'm going to be giving you ten minutes. I'm going to be looking at the clock fairly closely just because we have an in-camera after, so... Council has to stay a very long time this evening. You have a presentation in the form of a PowerPoint. Yeah, maybe we can get someone to assist the gentleman there and make sure that it's uh, up and running. All right, sir, the floor is yours uh, till 618 maximum. Thank you. Uh, I'm from the Orange, Bur Orange Bridge Merchants. We're not an association or anything, but we are trying to beautify the southern end of uh, the town by the Orange Bridge. Uh, we've, uh, we're coming tonight again, once again, not to ask for anything, no money, but just to kind of keep... Uh, keep you updated on where and what we've done so far and to thank the council um, let's see if I can just make this go forward just to review our last presentation we asked um, for for four to five things uh, to be looked at and of course one of them was the flower boxes uh, which I will show you what's happened we asked for banners which I will show you where we're at we asked for a sign in the median to say welcome to Parksville, although uh, that wasn't approved, and to slow the traffic, which I will have comments on later, and bike route comments. <clears throat> Here's the flower boxes, and the, I want to thank the city, and particularly Al Metcalf, for coming forward and helping us so much on getting the Orange Bridge uh, with the flower boxes. These are the boys that did all of the heavy lifting and uh, with the crew there 
we have four flower boxes, which if you have an opportunity to get down there, you will see. So we have the flower boxes in. This is what they're looking like now. We tried to do orange. It doesn't show very well, but there's orange flowers there for the orange bridge. This is what we have on the west side as you approach from the south. There are four of them. This is what's across the street. We're hoping that you would re <coughs> reconsider, and we're uh, going to ask for some more to do that side, of the, which is on the east side. We asked for banners. This is what the banner situation looks like right now and has been for some time. This is a banner which Mr. Caff was able to find for us that is in the city offers. The city have these banners um, at the city art. We are asking that because it's so late in the season, uh, being uh, the tourists uh, are already here, that we use these, even though they're old, they're still orange, and they're still in good enough shape to put up on the, uh, on the banners that are there. You also have, for later in the season, some lovely, hopefully don't miss that off, see greeting ones for Christmas time. These are like brand new, and they're still at the city uh, yards um, in some big box that I was able to find for them. <coughs> they're in good shape. Al brought them down for me to see how to design them so that we were going to design and make some new ones for the Orange Bridge area, which uh, as soon as we saw these, we said, well, we already have them. I will design some new ones as well, but uh, why not put these up right now because it's now July. So that's where we're asking for that. We asked about the bike. Uh, situation because we were concerned about the, the bikers, particularly coming from the um, resort area and how they approach the Sir, can you just bridge. move the banner a little bit? Sorry, I have a member of council that can't see the screen. We have a screen oh. that we look oh, at for the you? presentation. Oh, okay. yeah. so. <coughs> ah. Perfect, thank that you. That better? Okay. Um, we asked about the bicycle uh, situation uh, because there's lots of bikers going along there. We were more, more concerned about them as they approached the bridge from the north, trying to get a better approach, uh, more safe and so forth. Uh, in the meantime, the city has uh, graciously given uh, a bicycle rack, that one there. We can hold four or five bikes. That's, on, again, on the opposite side of the street, and they also put in a really nice bench up there. So that's, that's a a nice little thing. Down the corner, it's the um, southeast corner of, uh, of uh, Island Highway and uh, Martindale. Nice new things. It's great. These are some of the people I wanted to thank, uh, besides, of course, the council, which uh, I've had a chance to meet some. Uh, Mr. Metcalf, Mr. Frank, Patka, uh, Jim Swanson, who really likes bikes, Kevin, <laughs> uh, Peters, uh, Brody, Roy Harris, um, RCMP guy, and uh, the, the Traffic Watch volunteers. Talking to those guys, you can see I put up there, they got a guy while I was there at over 100K an hour. The Traffic Watch guys got the guy at 98. It's 50. But we'll go on. To, yes, I did do a little homework. This is the city. You can't see it very well. But I looked at the uh, city lines. It kind of doesn't show very well up there. But uh, it's interesting as you approach the city where the city is, where it stops with the RDN, and where it begins again. Interesting is one way to describe it, absolutely. <laughs> Gerrymandering is what I learned when I was in school because it's such an, uh, uh, there's a spot there. So about 10 feet across, I think, that <laughs> keeps it away from the RDN. I found it uh, still, my, my approach of driving in from uh, the southern approach, you really don't know, you don't feel like you're entering the city of Parksville until you cross the Orange Bridge. And that's where we were asking for consideration of doing some sort of a sign there saying, you know, welcome again maybe, even though there are some other signs along the way. Because you go through the RDN and you go through the city and you go through the RDN, Many people don't really know that they've reached Parksville 
until they go to the down, welcome to downtown Parksville. And you've already been in Parksville for most of the time. I don't know, there was more. But basically what we uh, wanted to do is thank the council for uh, getting some things going. So we have the flowers, we have some banners if, uh, if the council will agree to have these put up uh, after tonight. Uh, I will design some new ones, I have a few there uh, uh, later on. There are now, even though this didn't show up, I don't know why, there are now 11 people, 11 businesses involved uh, with the Orange Bridge Merchants Group. We are an association and a couple more are uh, working their way into it. Uh, we have that Saturday market, which is now growing all the time. There's now a market on the other side of the street as well. Uh, so we're, we're moving along, hopefully. Um, I guess what we're asking for is, again, to reconsider those few points. And then I'll, uh, I'll go with is we're still concerned about the speed a lot. And I was going to point out that as you approach from the south, cross over the Orange Bridge, and many people are trying to make that left hand or a U turn with their fifth wheel because they're coming into town and they miss their turn back at the resort area. And they're making that U turn at that little spot there. And either they're, getting, they're stopping all the traffic or they're going to get hit. Because the people approaching are not doing 55. They're doing 65, 75 average. And uh, I've seen the trucks, cars stopping the traffic. I've seen people come out of Martindale turning right, and uh, they have a, a drag race to get to the bridge, honking at each other. And we'd like you to consider some way to figure out how to slow it down. Yes, RCMP's been out there. The traffic watch has been there. Recently, the guys have been there. As soon as they go away, people go again. Uh, so we're, we're talking, uh, we're asking for that. We are also still hoping that we understand there are still some more of the flower boxes at the city yards piled up. I understood there were about 12 or 13 additional ones. And we'd like to ask for some more of those to put on the other side of the, uh, of the area. And more of the more of the merchants are talking about getting boxes farther on down. And the banner thing. So we're, uh, we're still coming back sort of hat in hand, but we don't want any money. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you, sir. So I'm going to open the floor to members of council here. I see Councillor Paul with a question. Thank you, Worship. Thank you very much for your presentation and the pictures. I have been down there, and I think those flower boxes, it's looking really nice down there. And it's my understanding when I spoke to you, and I've also so spoken to Mr. Metcalf about the boxes and he couldn't really do the, any more boxes because he didn't have our approval because we'd only approved for the site on your site. And uh, the banners, you looked at them, I think it's only four banners, isn't that right? Go ahead, Mr. Metcalf. Oh, mine's up. Yes, that through you too, Councillor Paul, uh, that's correct. Um, these banners were actually installed in 2006. Uh, so when I when I brought them to Mr. Held to, to show him the size of the banners, um, that was the one I brought. So um, I did find four that uh, or two sets that are in relatively good condition. Uh, they do fade quickly. Um, they probably would last a season, but not much more, especially with the sun and things like that. So. Sure, follow up in a second, but I'm curious now. So with the direction that was given at the last time uh, we had a discussion around this, um, would that uh, direction be sufficient to warrant the installation of those banners? Whose ever interpretation that might be? Your uh, Worship, um, the, the direction we had last time was that uh, Mr. Held was going to design the banners and bring them back to Council for approval and then those banners would be installed um, by the city. And that was loosely the direction. There was more words around Yeah, I'm that. trying to remember. We make so many resolutions. So, uh, okay, well, I'll go back to Councillor Powell for one second, and then I'll go to Councillor Greer. Go ahead. Thank you, Worship. I thought my understanding was that, that uh, Mr. Held was going to work with staff to develop a banner that you thought would be appropriate, not necessarily come back to Council. Could very well be. That could be. My recollection was that, that it would, would 
be presented back to council for the, for the basic approval of the design. Right. Yeah. Because we have such great collective taste. This is clear. All right. Go ahead, Councillor Greer. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Robert. Everything does look good down there. And just so you can get up and running with the banners you have and maybe another four boxes, if that's possible, I'd make the motion that we go ahead with this, with what uh, Mr. Hell would like to do. So we have a motion from Councillor Greer to uh, install the banners as presented, as you indicated there are four of them, and also the addition of yep. four, four boxes. more boxes. Is that all you wanted, Mr. Hell, was four boxes? And that's seconded by Councillor Powell. Okay, so uh, motion's on the floor. Now, Mr. Metcalf, we do have four boxes? Uh, yes, we have four boxes that would be available. Um, just to clarify, if we install them on the, um, on the south side, or on, excuse me, on the East. north side of the road, uh, one of the challenges is that um, our preference would be that they would be actually installed on private property. If they're installed on public property, there's there's a small grass strip there, but uh, we mow that grass strip on a on a weekly basis, and all it would mean is additional hand mowing around them. So if they were going to be installed, our preference would be that they would be actually installed and maintained on private property. Yeah, and I recall that discussion before. So um, is there private property available in that area that there could is. be utilized? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So anyway, we have that motion on the floor. Anyone wishing to speak to that motion? Go ahead, Councillor Paul Davidson. Thank you. Through you, uh, through you, Your Worship, to, um, to Mr. Held, I, I appreciate that there are um, private properties for the four additional planters, but I just want to make sure the the private property that you have in mind where these will go, the people who own that property, are they want these planters there? They've said that? I, I have uh, had discussions with uh, Larry from Big Tent uh, thing, and he's, he has uh, indicated that he is interested, and if not, uh, for all of them, three of them, and we still could certainly use one of them on our side because when people make the turn and they figure they've made it wrong, they turn into my place and drive right over and over the sidewalk and everything right to get back on Martindale, we'd be happy to put one to stop them from driving over the lawn. So <laughs> we could use four. Okay, so obviously with private property owner's permission. And no just question. A, another quick follow-up question. Okay. And they will be main, planted and maintained by the Orange Bridge merchants. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. We, we're doing good. Um, I understand uh, Larry's wife is on his case, so I think they'll be uh, taken care of. <laughs> All right, very good. Any further comments from members of council? Councillor Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, clarification on the on the verbiage, because they, obviously they're coming back because we mentioned four last time. Can we just open up the number to whatever the staff uh, sees fit? Because they, they did mention that there was other people down, further down the road. So if it makes sense to open up that number to for future reference rather than four and have them come back again. Okay, so you're looking for an amendment to the motion to... Yeah, let me be the judge of whether it's a friendly <laughs> amendment or not, because I am a little bit concerned because it does sort of set a precedent now, and if we just leave a wide open motion out there, then you, you've got a lot of private property owners all the way down that strip that might say, we're mine, right? Um, I, I kind of like the idea that there's a number involved, but I, it's up to your council to decide. So are you moving an amendment then to um, essentially make the motion not specific in terms of number? I don't think that's really friendly. I think it does change the motion. Uh, I was just, uh, in reference to, to this uh, presentation, so within the Orange Bridge uh, merchants, not to spread it all the way down the, the causeway or the... Okay, so um, let me just get the motion read out first, if possible. I just want to make real clear here exactly okay. what we're voting on. That city staff install banners and an additional four flower planters in accordance with the request from the Orange Bridge merchants. And, uh, and you're saying essentially to remove that number four out of that motion as an amendment. Okay, so do we have a seconder for that amendment? All right, don't see a seconder, so uh, I take it your amendment's failed. So we're back on the original motion. So um, any further discussion, if necessary? Councillor Paul Davidson. Thank you, Your Worship. Is it necessary to include in that motion also that they will be um, maintained by the Orange Bridge merchants, or is that a given 
in light of what we've previously supported? I think it follows up in light of the previous resolution that we've made. I think it's clearly understood that we're not directing staff to maintain anything or just provide those. Okay, so no further questions, no further comments. All those in favor of the motion, opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Actually, I have one late question here from Councillor Lefebvre. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Hill. Have you discussed with the RCMP the issue of speed? Because the same thing happens up at the Temple Store. The minute that that highway widens up, it becomes the Daytona 500 to get to wherever people are going. Have you talked to the RCMP, or should we get staff and ourselves to sit down and talk with the RCMP about something? Thank you for your question. Yes, I've talked to Roy Harris, who's the RCMP District 69 Speed Watch Coordinator. I've talked to the people, the traffic watch, the local people that come out in the traffic watch on numerous occasions. And we've talked about, which we brought up last time, you know, something like the rumble strips or anything like that. And I've talked to Mr. Metcalf about that. And there doesn't seem to be an easy solution to it, because it's just like you say. I drive up to the Temple Street myself to go home, and it's the narrowing down. And you have to get in lane to get in the bridge, over the bridge, or you're going to be in the water. So what they, those guys out there, and they, you know, they got their binoculars to see if you're talking on your cell phone and your belt, and then they do the gun. They didn't have a solution for that, unless there was some, like the British call traffic calming, and some way you can slow them down. All right. Thank you very much, sir. Have yourself a good evening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move to our third delegation, which is actually our second now this evening. And this is from the Royal Canadian Legion and the Parks and Lawn Bowling Club. It's a presentation by David Livingston of the Royal Canadian Legion and the Parks and Lawn Bowling Club regarding applications for a permissive taxation exemption on the properties located at 146 Hearst Avenue West and 149 Stamford Avenue East, respectively. Gentlemen, if you want to come on down. All right. Ten minutes, gentlemen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Your Worship and members of council, my name is Don Livingstone, not David. I apologize, David. I haven't called you that outside like that. It's even in my notes. Maybe you could consider a name change? I could do that, yes. All right. Thank you, sir. I have a brother. Thank you, Don. I am second vice president of the local branch of the Legion. With me is the Legion's president, David Doshkosh, on my left. I'm also the secretary of the Parksville Lawn Bowling Club. With me on my right is the club's president, Mr. Alan Brunskill. The purpose of today's delegation is, delegations, I suppose, is to seek an exemption from the requirement to pay real property taxes for both organizations before you. We were advised that the time and space shortages require that both applications be heard together. I have never done a joint application before. I'm still of the view that one has to be dealt with at a time. In other words, they're both out for the same ends but through different methods. So with that, I would like, if I could, to begin discussing the situation as it relates to the Lawn Bowling Club, Parksville Lawn Bowling Club. Certainly, Mr. Livingston. Just so you're aware, there actually is not a requirement to come as a delegation. You merely submit the paperwork and meet all the criteria. But I do think it's often helpful just to give council a sense of what the organizations do. I think it probably is, Your Worship. Yeah. So just, you know, there's no hard, fast rule is what I'm saying. Just go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you. The Lawn Bowling Club, as most of you know, is located at 149 Stanford Avenue in the city. The principal use of the property is as a lawn bowling club, not surprisingly. The club provides its members with physical activity and social interaction from April through October. From October to March, the members participate in short mat bowling, cribbage, darts, bridge, and mahjong. Dinners and other social events take place throughout the year. 
Many of our members, for many of our members, the club is their lifeline to the community and their lives enriched by their participation and volunteering. All ages benefit. However, over 90% of our members are seniors. They participate in outdoor lawn bowling events ranging from friendly games to challenging league and tournaments. Outdoor lawn bowling is available seven days a week throughout the summer months and the clubhouse is available for both summer and winter activities. Other fundraising sources attempted by the club uh, include an annual garage sale and a thrifty smile card program. We also apply to volunteer at Beach Fest each year and to the federal government's New Horizons Seniors Grant Program, for both of which we have been accepted only once. Some of this funding has been used to purchase a defibrillator for the club and a number of our members have paid for CPR training, uh, which includes the use of the defibrillator. Club members also participate in fundraising activities for local charities. Donations are made annually to the Hospice Society, the War Amps Champs Program, the Cancer Society, and the Salvation Army Food Bank. <coughs> Excuse me. We host the Special Olympics Bocce Team, allowing a permanent pitch on our lease land. And also residents from Stanford Place, uh, who we entertain each month for their own special lawn bowling day. There are no fees charged to either of these groups. The club pays for the services of a cleaner who attends once a week to clean the interior of the building. All other club operations and maintenance are handled by volunteer club members. We volunteer to maintain the bowling green, the buildings, the extensive and complicated equipment, the grounds and the gardens. Grass is cut weekly, the gardens are planted and weeded, and the boulevard along Sanford is cut. The land utilized by the Parksville Lawn Bowling Club is owned by the city of Parksville. There is no reference in the lease between the city and the club to the payment of real property taxes whatsoever. Historically, the right to impose real property taxes was limited to the taxation of the registered owner of the property, <coughs> in this case, the city. Our president has researched 14 other lawn bowling clubs on the island, including those in Qualicum, Nanaimo, Courtney, Port Alberni, Powell River and Victoria, and all occupy municipally owned property, and none of them pay real property taxes. In some cases, for example, Courtney, which is uh, the club there, is refurbishing its premises, and the city of Courtney has agreed to grant a $70,000 assistance to the process. Now, subject to any questions that anybody may have with respect to the lawn bowling organization, I'll move on to the Legion. I'll go ahead and open the floor. Any questions? Go ahead, Councilor. Thank you, Your Worship. I have a question through you to staff. Is it correct that the, uh, the charging of taxes is not in the existing lease? I love asking them questions. They have to go off the top of their head. Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. If Mann. I may, Your Worship, I can't answer that without looking at the lease. Go ahead, so if, if it's not mentioned in the lease, then what would happen? Mr. Mance. Again, without looking at the lease, I'm not going to comment. You see where we're going there. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Livingston, if I don't have any other questions of council regarding the Lawn Bowling Club. Go ahead. Thank you. This will mark, today is the third time that I have appeared before you as a group on behalf of the Legion. Um, the primary purpose of which is to raise funds for donations to veterans, their families, and, public, and the public at large, as well as a place to be where veterans and others may gather and socialize. Branch 49 also operates a loan cupboard from which wheelchairs, canes, crutches, walkers, transfer benches, and a myriad of other types of equipment used by the infirm and the elderly are available to the public at large from our Legion premises. The need for such services would appear obvious, and, the, and Branch 49 is unaware of the availability of such a service elsewhere in Parksville. To the best of its knowledge, Branch 49 is unaware of any other funding sources that it could call upon to assist in providing such services. Services provided by Branch 49 are all run by volunteers. Volunteers operate the loan cupboard, run the meat draw, the bingo, and the annual poppy drive. 
Branch 49 does operate a licensed lounge and receives additional revenue from renting its hall and other amenities. Without these revenues, Branch 49 would not be in a position to meet its operational overhead, which in turn would prevent the branch from using its premises to earn income from gaming events and poppy campaign, 100% of which is returned to the com community through charitable donations. It is of primary importance that Council realize that all of the money obtained through gaming and other fundraising events are returned to the community. Not one penny of donations is used for administrative or operational purposes. Uh, in, in the written uh, documents that were submitted with this application is a summary of last, the last six years' donations by Branch 49, totaling $334,630. If these figures are extrapolated over the previous 15 years, they show that the branch has donated in excess of $1.2 million directly to the company within that time frame. In addition, and as a result of the operation of its loan covered, Branch 49 has saved the citizens of Parksville and the rest of Oceanside upwards of $200,000 annually in rental fees, which they don't have to pay, or $3 million in the same 15-year period. The exemption from property taxes granted by the City of Parksville for this year, 2014, went a long way to enabling the branch to continue to serve our community in ways and with amounts that no other organization in our understanding does. Legions in Courtney, Qualicum, Lanceville, Esquimo, and Langford have all been granted exemptions and pay no property taxes. The Legion has contacted the owner of its neighbor, the Rod and Gun, and has been assured that the Rod and Gun does not consider the Legion to be its competitor with respect to bar or food sales. That's our submission. All right, thank you, Mr. Livingston. So I don't believe we require a motion or anything of that, but I will no. ask staff to look into the matter regarding the lease and the status in terms of the Long Bowling Club and also to please ensure that uh, we meet all applicable deadlines this year for either organization by working with Mr. Livingston here uh, for any future needs in terms of the uh, this year's tax exemptions. And is there any member of council that has anything further to say or ask with Mr. Livingston? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Neufeld. Thanks very much, Your Worship. The comment that I would make as far as uh, these two organizations is concerned is that they do provide a tremendous service uh, for the um, uh, uh, residents of the community and, and for uh, the, the greater number of uh, people in, in Oceanside. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat biased, of course. I have a, a Legion membership and, and I do use the, the premises. I look upon what occurs within those premises as being extremely important for the members that are there. Uh, although I, I uh, may have to uh, recuse myself as far as the decision is concerned uh, with respect to the uh, the Legion. Uh, I think that both the Legion and the uh, Curling Club are uh, representative uh, institutions that uh, are beneficial as far as the community is concerned, and I would heartily support uh, the use of, of uh, our, our dollars to ensure that uh, they are not put in a, a jeopardy situation. <coughs> so that um, I, I think that uh, these are two organizations that uh, merit the, uh, the use of. Uh, our dollars to ensure their uh, continued survival. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your time and effort this evening, and Thank we'll be in touch certainly with respect to the first matter and also the latter. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Neufeld, um, you're just a member of the Legion, you're not part of the executive? Yeah, so I don't believe you're in a conflict of interest. Had you been in a conflict of interest, it would have already been too late. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to the correspondence section of tonight's meeting, and we have three pieces of correspondence this evening, the first of which is from the good regional district of Nanaimo, and it's uh, regarding the uh, community Service Local uh, Sewer Boundary Amendment Bylaw, number 889.67, uh, 2014. And uh, do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Lefebvre, seconded by Councillor Greer. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Moving on, we have the second piece from the Union of BC Municipalities, and uh, it's regarding 
the 2024, 2014 to 2024 Community Works Fund Agreement. There is a recommendation there. Do we have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Powell Davidson, seconded by Councillor Powell to receive and then to authorize myself and the corporate officer to sign the Community Works Fund Agreement on behalf of the City of Parksville. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Finally, we have a third piece of correspondence. This is from the Kingsley Low Rental Housing Society. It's a request for support for Federation of Canadian Municipalities Action on Affordable Housing, and there is a recommendation to receive. Moved by Councillor Fave, seconded by Councillor Powell. Any discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Powell-Davidson. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have a question, and I'm looking at page 65, sorry, page 65 and 66. Um, I haven't heard of um, a housing crunch motions, so I was, this isn't the time place to get that definition, but I am curious if that isn't something that we as a council should be looking at, because um, to my knowledge we haven't passed anything like that in the past, and I'm wondering if we could direct staff to uh, provide us with a brief report at one of our subsequent meetings. What I was actually going to do is uh, suggest very much along the lines of what you're suggesting is just uh, if council is interested in supporting this, and I, I think we should, uh, based on the, basically the presentations I received at the FCM where a lot of this discussion was taking place, I could simply have staff um, put forward a, a resolution. You've seen these before. It's uh, many, as you know, cities have already made this resolution. It's simply urging the government to maintain the funding for this important cause. So I can certainly do that at the next meeting if council so wishes, and in the meantime, we simply need to receive and, and Go ahead, Councillor. Go Your Worship. We, we do do that. I mean, we practice what, what we preach because we did it in the case of Huswick Place and, and a few others. So. Very big challenge for our city is rental accommodation. We have some of the lowest rental availability on the island, so uh, it's obviously important. So by all means, um, if there's no further discussion, I'll call it on the motion to receive. All those in favour? Opposed? That's carried unanimously and expect another item at the next meeting related to this. All right, that concludes correspondence this evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're moving now into reports. And the first report is from our Director of Operations, and it's regarding the Snow Removal Corporate Policy Number 8.10. Mr. Metcalf, could you give us the background, please? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, this report introduces for Council's consideration a revised Winter Operations Snow and Ice Control Policy. The policy uh, outlines the actions the city will take for clearing roads and snow and ice from municipal streets and sidewalks during winter storms. Uh, since the policy was first adopted in 1983 and last revised in 1997, the city's expanded. Uh, many new roads, sidewalks uh, have been added, making it difficult to achieve the levels of service outlined in the existing policy. Uh, staff's worked with our municipal insurance agency uh, with a goal to present Council with a revised policy that's clear, effective, and most importantly, achievable. Uh, the revised policy will allow operations to better manage and maintain the roads and sidewalks during winter conditions, and is consistent with the traffic bylaw 1436, which in part states, uh, every owner and occupier of real property shall remove all snow and ice from sidewalks bordering their real property within 12 hours of the cessation of a snowfall or storm event which caused the accumulation. Um, under the current policy, all municipal streets and sidewalks are to be sanded on a 24-hour basis during slippery conditions and snow is to be cleared from all roads and sidewalks on a priority basis when the depth, depth of the snow reaches 2 inches or 50 millimeters. With the added, as mentioned, with the added roads and sidewalks, it's, it's very difficult or impossible to achieve uh, that level of service with our current resources. In the revised policy, the city will uh, still be required to sand, salt, the ice and plow roads on a priority basis. However, only sidewalks on or adjacent to city property, city-owned properties will be cleared by the city and only when the snowfall reaches or exceeds 100 millimeters. Um, the, the city crews, um, during periods of really heavy snowfall, the intent is that the city crews will still support and assist in clearing other sidewalks on interior roads with high pedestrian traffic. So those include such roads as the um, the Island Highway or the Alberni Highway. Uh, but this assistance would only be provided during regular working hours and only when the priority operations have been completed. Uh, it's anticipated that under normal win winter conditions, uh, the level of, this level of service is uh, achievable with our current resources.
staff's recommendations as per the agenda. Thank you, Mr. McCaff. So we have a recommendation essentially to receive and to adopt the new policy. Do we have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. Discussion? Councillor Lefebvre. Thank you, Worship. <clears throat> it's always interesting to discuss snow removal on July the 7th. Um, I vividly recall the snowstorm of 2008, December 2008. I've got a picture of myself in front of my garage with snow up to my waist. Um, what about the aspect of, I guess this is more of a comment, maybe a question. What about the aspect of when we get severe snowstorms, treating it as, a, um, as an event where people should, if at all possible, stay home and then use whatever emergency services we have to provide people with medication or, or groceries or whatever the case may be. I know that that's not, that's not easily doable also, but th there comes a time, I remember in 2008, I think it took uh, more than a full day to get people out of certain areas because I was getting phone calls. They couldn't leave their premises because the snow was so deep and we don't have that, that much of equipment to get it out. But I'm, I'm thinking of, not a catastrophic, but a severe storm like we had in December of 2008, whereby the, the advice would be, let us clean the roads, stay home, and at that point in time, through whatever, the fire department or whatever, search and rescue, whatever, whoever could help us out to get stuff to people that need it, that badly need it, by waiting a day or two or three. Any comment, Mr. Metcalf? Probably good? Okay, very good. Councillor Powell. Thank you, Worship. This is really easy. What's, how much is 75 millimeters compared to two inches? Really, you want a conversion? Well, that's 7.5 centimeters, uh, so that's a little bit more than two inches, right? Considerably more, more like three and a bit. That's right. That's my imperial measurements, three and a bit. Three inches, okay. So, three inches exactly, there you go. So, is there any further discussion on this? Go ahead, Councillor Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my question comes down to liability. Um, when we're suggesting that people clear the sidewalks in front of their premises, of business or residences, um, it comes down to how often does that need to be done? We're talking about city-owned infrastructure and then, um, you know, people, sometimes elderly people, clearing their sidewalks um, and having to salt them regularly because I think a cleared sidewalk is more dangerous than a snowy sidewalk if it's not salted properly. Um, so when it comes down to liability, is the city still liable if the, the sidewalks aren't cleared in front of people's residences or the residence is liable or the business is liable? Um, do you, I don't know if that's an easy question to answer, um, but it, it just kind of, it gets a little muddy if we're saying within the... Um, within the recommendation that people have to, we're forcing people to clear their sidewalks or recommending that we, they clear their sidewalks which is actually making things more dangerous if they're not cleared properly and salted. And you thought this is probably gonna be straightforward. Go ahead, Mr. Metcalf. Um, the, one of the recommendations from our insurance agency is to develop policies that are attainable. And actually in developing those policies, often a defense for liability is a policy defense. Um, so that's part of it. When, when we actually adopt the, or when we present the policies, we're trying to present something that is attainable. So in terms of the liability related to whether or not a, a, a property owner clears their property and somebody slips and trips on, I, I can't honestly answer that question, although it puts us in a better position having a, a good solid policy defense and the bylaws to back it up. Okay. All right, any further comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed, carried, thank you. Moving on, you're not off the hook yet, Mr. Metcalf. I'm looking for the background regarding the budget allocation for play equipment upgrade at the community park, sir. Thank you, Your Worship. There's currently $52,000 included in the 2014 financial plan for the purchase and replacement of play equipment in the community park. Uh, the sh city share of the expenditure is 37650 with the balance being funded by the Lions Club of Parksville in the form of a $10,000 cash donation and 4350 or $4,350 in grant funding, which was used to purchase the handicap swing. Um, play, uh, play equipment is very expensive, and the allocation of the 2014 budget provided for the replacement 
of uh, several pieces of equipment on a priority basis but did not allow for all of the pieces of equipment that are beginning to show their age and are nearing the end of their useful life. In a recent meeting with some of the members of the Lions Club, they identified that as a result of a better than expected fundraising event, um, that they had an additional $20,000 uh, that they'd like to contribute for the purchase of additional equipment. Uh, the purpose of this report is to seek Council's approval to authorize staff to increase the budget allocations for play equipment upgrades at the community park from $52,000 to $72,000. Uh, the city share of the expenditure would remain the same at $37,650 with the additional $20,000 being provided from the Lions Club. So we're just asking for the authorization to, to change that allocation. Just as an interesting uh, little side point on this, when I was meeting with the, science, uh, the Lions Club, they identified that in 2013, um, that volunteers uh, provided 444 hours of fundraising, and actually they also provided an additional 2,200 of hours of uh, work, volunteer work in that playground. And staff's recommendation is as per the agenda. And just for additional background, you know, that park was just named one of tens, or one of Canada's top ten by TripAdvisor, and I have a really strong feeling that playground that's there is a big part of the reason why. So uh, we definitely have a good thing going. But uh, I'm looking first for a motion uh, to receive and then ultimately uh, follow the direction of the recommendation here. Moved by Councillor Paul Davidson, seconded by Councillor Newfeld. Now discussion. Go ahead, Councillor Newfeld. Thank you very much, Your Worship. Uh, I, I think this is a, a tremendous uh, opportunity to, in fact, use uh, the Parksville Lions uh, and their fundraising activities and to, uh, to contribute and, and to, to basically pip, uh, piggyback on, on uh, what they're doing. Uh, and it does enhance the, uh, the, the city's um, overall look and, and uh, appeal as far as the uh, community and bringing in uh, more tourists. And, and uh, as far as the trip advisor is concerned, I concur with you, uh, your, your worship. I think it's uh, tremendous, and, and uh, I'm very much in favor of this. I think it's a tremendous opportunity, and, and look forward to uh, working with the Lions on this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Greer. Thank you, Worship. No, I agree. This is, a, this is a great playground, and we should support it, and I'm sure we will. Uh, they, I'm just a little confused, the fact that we got 52000 in the budget, and with the 30000 from the Lions, that's 82000 um, I just don't get those numbers right. Maybe you can explain why we why we have to increase our budget when we're getting thirty thousand from the alliance. It's the allocation. We'll go ahead, Mr. Metcalf. There's actually no increase in the city portion of the funding. In order for us to be able to change the financial plan, uh, we need to have council's approval to to uh, change that um, uh, change the expenditure or change the out change the allocation in the in the budget. Um, so this is just, it's more of a housekeeping issue. Um, be, well, not a housekeeping issue, it's for council's consideration, I didn't mean that. Um, but, it, but it does just represent the, the added share from the lines. Just, just to follow up. I, I get that. Um, Go ahead. I'm just wondering, we do have the 52 in there, you mentioned. And, and, and with the other 30, we're up to 82,000. Okay, so the 52 includes the 30,000. It's a little, little confusing for me. And Do you want to quickly go over I'm the numbers again, Mr. Metcalf? Metcalf? Sure. Um, so, so there was $52,000 in the 2014 financial plan. Um, that, that was made up of a contribution of $10,000 in cash and $4,350 in grant funding from, that the Lions had secured. Uh, there was $37,000, $37,650 from the city to make up the 52. So it was 37 plus the 14,350 to make up the 52,000. And subsequent to that, the Lions Club came forward and, and identified that they had an additional $20,000 to contribute. So we were originally <coughs> permitted to spend $52,000 of 37,000 of which was the city funding and the balance from the Lions. Now with the additional $20,000 that the Lions have fundraised, that will bring the total expenditure to 72000 Okay, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Go ahead, Councillor Lafayette. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm fully supportive of this effort. Um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out to the Lions Club, and I think there's some people here tonight from the Lions Club, is that 
I was very, very much impressed by the installation of a wheelchair swing. And uh, hopefully those kinds of things will be continued because uh, that's one of, the, uh, one of the things that the uh, Access Oceanside Association is now uh, focusing on more and more that they can be included. And this is great. And what, what's in the park now is, 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 is terrific. So uh, congratulations. And I hope that um, in the future there will be other things that will be either wheelchair accessible or people with ambulatory, severe ambulatory problems that can still challenge us, can still use the park. Thank you. All right, thank you, Councillor Lefebvre. You know, I think if we're smart, we will do more of that because I know people will travel specifically for that purpose, right? Because it isn't something that's commonly available, especially if you're in a wheelchair or uh, you have other access issues. So hopefully we carry on. All right, further conversation on this? If not, I'm going to call it. All those in favor, opposed, and that's carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, Mr. Metcalf, catch your breath. We're going to move to another member of staff now. Mr. Russell, can you give us the background with respect to... Sorry? No, the whole thing, whole thing. Now looking at Mr. Russell to come forward with regard to the uh, report regarding the consideration of cash in lieu of park for proposed subdivision 577 Pym Street North. Go ahead, Mr. Russell. If Mayor Worship and Progressive Council, um, the city has received an application for preliminary layout approval for a subdivision at uh, 577 Pym Street North. As part of that process, the number of lots triggers the requirement for 5% parkland dedication or the op option of providing cash in lieu for the required 5%. Um, basically, in this case, the official community plan and parks uh, open space master plan do not reveal any specific desire for parkland dedication in this location. In, in addition, the OCP generally discourages the dedication of um, pocket parks unless there is a demonstrable community benefit or neighborhood demand. Um, it should be noted that cash in lieu of parkland is required under legislation to be deposited in a reserve fund established for the purposes of acquiring parklands. The recommendation is as per the report. Do we have a motion on the recommendation? So moving the recommendation to receive and to essentially move to the cash in lieu. Go ahead, that's Councillor. Greer and seconded by Council Lefebvre. Discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. You're opposed? All right, very good. Okay, Mr. Russell, can you give us the background with respect to your follow-up report consideration of an application to facilitate an affordable housing development for the Kingsley Low Rental Housing Society at 312 Hearst Avenue West? If your Mayor Worship, um, this is a follow-up report uh, with respect to the proposed uh, bylaw amendment application to rezone the subject property from RS1 single-family residential to a newly created uh, site-specific comprehensive development zone to facilitate uh, 28 uh, units on a 0.43-acre uh, site. Um, as part of this amendment proposal, an amendment to the official community plan is also required um, due to the density that's proposed. Uh, the recommendation is as per the report. Okay, so we have a five-part recommendation there. Do we have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Greer. Discussion? Begins a very um, significant process. Okay, no discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? <coughs> and that's carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, Mr. Russell, we'll carry on. This is item E, and it's a follow-up report, consideration of an updated sign bylaw. If I may, Your Worship, um, a proposed update to the sign bylaw has been in works for some time. Um, the updated sign bylaw is intended to provide an improved end user experience through clearer language, use of illustrations, and better all organization of content. In addition, rewriting the sign bylaw has provided an opportunity to take advantage of changes in provincial legislation particularly the ability to address um, obsolete or abandoned signs. Another, a number of other improvements have also been incorporated into the sign bylaw in consultation with uh, the Chamber of Commerce, the Parksville Downtown Business Association, sign companies, and those are um, detailed in the report. The recommendation is per, as per the agenda. All right, thank you, Mr. Russell. So we do have a three-part recommendation there. Do we have a mover and a seconder? Move Councillor Powell-Davidson. Seconded, Councillor Morrison. Discussion? Councillor Powell-Davidson. Thank you, Worship. I, I want to thank staff for the, the lot of work that they put into revising this signed bylaw. I want to thank the Chamber and the Parcel District 
uh, Parksville um, and District Chamber of Commerce and the Parksville Downtown Business Association. I'm really pleased to see this coming forward and very pleased to see some uh, enforcement of obsolete signs throughout the city. Thank you. All right, thank you. Further discussion? Council Lefebvre. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, this is an item that's been discussed. Uh, I want to thank also the staff, and I think it's a great job. I want to just specifically hone in on sandwich boards. This is an item that comes up invariably at the Access Association, uh, uh, Access Oceanside Association meetings, uh, where sandwich boards, uh, so somebody that's in a wheelchair or somebody that's got some uh, ambulatory challenges and needs wide space. Um, what, what folk who are in wheelchairs or scooters tell me that they do if the sandwich board is in their way, they move the sandwich board because they can't get by. And they can't, they're not going to drive off the sidewalk onto the street to get by. So I, I congratulate staff. They've, they've, made, um, they've made it quite clear in the bylaw in terms of distances and where they should be. And uh, I would urge uh, folk that have sandwich boards to, uh, to keep that in mind because somebody that's in a, in a motor scooter, a scooter of some sort or in a wheelchair, is not going to uh, go around the sandwich board and get onto the get onto the road to get by the sandwich board. They're going to move it, and that's what they adamantly tell me they're going to do. So, um, if you don't want your sandwich boards moved, I guess you better try as much as you can to keep it in such a way that uh, there's mobility for people that do have mobility challenges. Thank you. Further discussion. Councillor Newfeld. Thanks very much, Your Worship. The uh, only comment that I would have is that uh, when I er originally uh, read this, uh, I thought it was somewhat convoluted, but I would like to um, uh, applaud uh, Mr. Russell, who um, spoke to some of the number of is issues that uh, Mr. Morrison uh, brought up, Councillor Morrison brought up, and, and uh, I did understand what was uh, going to be brought forward, so I, I thank you for that, uh, Mr. Russell. All right, thank you. Further comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. All right, Mr. Russell, can you give us the uh, background with respect to your follow-up report on Zoning and Development Bylaw Amendment 103, 105, 111, 115, and 125 McMillan Street, please? If I may, Your Worship, uh, this is a follow-up report on the proposed amendment at uh, the properties at 103, 105, 111, 115, and 125 McMillan Street. Uh, the proposal is to amend the zone to remove the existing single-family residential use and to allow for an apartment use to facilitate an 18-unit uh, apartment development on the subject property. Um, the report details um, the applicant's uh, public open house as well as a uh, referral to the Advisory Planning Commission. Uh, the recommendations are as per the report. All right, so you have a recommendation before you. This will also set us up for a public hearing. Do we have a mover or a seconder? Moved by Councillor Paul Davidson, seconded by Councillor Greer. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Russell, we're now on item G. Uh, can you give us the background with respect to your report regarding carriage house regulations, please? If I may, Your Worship, uh, the report is in response to Council's resolution that staff review the correspondence received from the Oceanside Development and Construction, Construction Association and pro provide options and recommendations for Council's consideration. All right, very good. We have a two-part recommendation there. I'm looking for a mover and a seconder, and that's to amend. Moved by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. Any discussion? Go ahead, Councillor Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for clarification, I just wanted to confirm that the amendments are including the, um, the recommendations from the uh, Development and Construction Association. Mr. Russell. If I may, Your Worship, the report and bylaw include the recommendations with related, related to the rezoning aspect as in amending the proposed um, construction height to 4.6 meters as well as exempting lots with only one dwell, dwelling unit on them. Um, with respect to the development variance permit process and a reduced fee for development variance permit applications, uh, no bylaw is proposed at this time, but the report does provide um, and basically receive for information on that topic. Something for future consideration, if we so choose. Okay, any further discussion? Being, uh, go ahead, Councillor Neufeld. I'd like to clarify exactly what we're voting on here now. Uh, as far as the accessory uh, carriage house setback and height, re height regulations, what are we, in, in fact, uh, dealing with here? I, 
uh, you know, it has uh, three, three possibilities there, amend the zoning bylaw, proceed with uh, the already introduced bylaw, or maintain the current regulations. I can support one of the three, but in fact, uh, I'm, I'm looking at uh, what, what, what we are actually going to be voting on at, at this uh, point. If I Do you want to go over it again, Mr. Russell, please? Sure, and if I may, Your Worship, the actual vote on the bylaw appears later on on the bylaw section of the agenda. So at this point, the vote would be primarily on receiving the report for information and, and the recommendation contained therein. Um, basically, there's a couple different options, but with respect to um, the, uh, the uh, carriage house provision, uh, Council has a, a number of choices. One is to maintain um, the status quo with, with respect to the existing regulations that are in place. Um, one option put forward is to go with the um, initial bylaw that staff dra drafted in response to council, um, council's desire to look at this topic. And the, um, the other option is to um, proceed with a, a by repeal um, second reading of the, the bylaw that was introduced um, with incorporation of the comments, of the changes based on the comments were, that were received. Um, the staff recommendation is to proceed, um, is to um, ultimately when you get to the bylaw section, the staff recommendation is to rescind second reading and amend the bylaw as per the, um, as per the comments received. Okay. All right, very good. So I'm going to call the vote then. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Okay, turning it over to you, Mr. Manson, can you give us the background with respect to the ERWS loan authorization bylaw and your attached report? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. The Englishman River Water Service Management Board has provided the city with an up-to-date um, ERWS water intake treatment plant and required distribution system estimated cost and cost allocations for the city and regional district. Uh, this is in anticipation of the uh, borrowing referendum um, that is proposed to be held in conjunction with the upcoming general municipal election. Uh, staff have reviewed these costs and have done a number of alternative uh, funding scenarios to determine potential impact on water rates and development cost charge rates. Uh, staff have also met and confirmed with provincial ministries that despite recent announcement, announcements, no senior government uh, grants are available prior to the potential general election referendum date. Um, accordingly, uh, staff is recommending option four, which is the option that's outlined in the agenda, which is a compromise to what would otherwise be the impossible situation of not being able to proceed due to fiscal realities and yet having to proceed due to treatment and capacity requirements. And as I said, the recommendation is as per the agenda. Okay, so before I ask for a motion, you are all aware of the recommendation and staff's uh, report. Uh, I have an alternative that I'd like to read out uh, and then I'll explain why real quick after. Uh, and then I'll leave it up to your good uh, judgment, Council, on which direction you would like to move in. So, um, as opposed to the staff recommendation, my alternative would be that the report from the Chief Administrative Officer be received, et cetera, et cetera, that the Mayor, on behalf of Council, write to Honorable Terry Lake, could BC Minister of Health, with copies to Premier Christy Clark and MLA Michelle Stilwell, and to the Honorable Rona Ambrose, Minister of Health for Canada, with copies to Prime Minister Stephen Harper and MP James Lunny, and other relevant provincial and federal ministers as required to request funding assistance on the basis of a one-third, one-third, one-third shared cost for the construction of the ERWS water intake treatment plant required distribution system. In effect, it's very similar to option three in the actual report. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that we send off letters direct to the appropriate ministries, um, independent of any of the traditional process that we would normally have had in place by now, and that we seek full funding in that one-third, one-third, one-third split. Uh, we would need to make a final decision on this prior to August 5th if we want to ensure that there's still a referendum question available in the next election time frame. Uh, so uh, my hope would be if we were to go in this direction that we would get an indication back prior to that time uh, from uh, both the federal and provincial governments to determine exactly how eligible and what we can expect for funding. 
in order to inform us as to what we would do in terms of a referendum. If uh, that doesn't occur, then um, Council could still go with the option as recommended by staff, which is splitting it up into two pieces. But of course, as you saw in the staff report, um, there's you know, some downside to doing that as well. You may actually lose out on significant funding for half the project. Uh, and then, of course, the worst case scenario is uh, you wait until uh, the next term of office to have that referendum if indeed there's further delays. Ultimately, though, as you all know, we won't go over it all again. Uh, we do run into some pretty hard deadlines, and uh, at some point we will lose half our water supply if we don't have the system up and running or that deadline isn't pushed back. So I leave it to your good graces. Councillor Greer. Thank, thank you, Your Worship. I, I would certainly make that recommendation that we uh, send letters to these people first the one I read out. That's right, the one okay. you read out, because it's so important that at least we get some word back uh, before the deadline. So uh, I would recommend and move that uh, we do that first. Do we have a seconder? Seconded by Council Lefebvre. Okay, so we have that motion now on the floor. Uh, everyone's clear as I read it out. Essentially, it's asking for full funding and uh, sending off letters to all the appropriate individuals at both federal and provincial levels. And uh, I'll leave it open for discussion. Uh, as a seconder, you can go first, Council Lefebvre. Thank you, Worship. Um, following up on a question we got earlier this evening, and I apologize, I've got a bad summer cold. I don't know why, but I've got it. Um, I've sat on the AWS, ERWS now for s several years. And I've attended all of the presentations by all of the, uh, all of the highly qualified uh, consultants that were hired to work on the project. And all of the, all of the options are well documented in the minutes uh, of these meetings and staff are fully, fully aware of the, of the pros and cons that were discussed. We've never faced this type of situation before. And the situation I want to describe is that uh, because we knew, we knew this was coming uh, some time ago. Uh, whereby an un unelected uh, directive policy setting body, which is Island Health, reporting to the Ministry of Health in the, in the provincial government, has set out a compliance directive for water quality. We don't have a choice. They've simply said, thou shalt do this, period. And uh, that in itself is a challenge. So the city complied with that request, uh, starting to work on this several years ago, and has provided due diligence. And now the project is shelf ready. It's ready to go. The problem is we don't, have any, we don't know what kind of money we can get from the provincial and federal government. And uh, I'm not in favor of, uh, of any kind of a referendum at this point in time until we find out from those who are directing us to do this what kind of funding they're going to provide to us. Uh, we find ourselves in a position where, as I said, we're shelf ready, we're ready to go, we're ready to go to public tender tomorrow. But we don't know what the funding is and it's not fair to taxpayers to tell them what they're going to have to, uh, what, they're, what they might have to pay, what they won't have to pay, and, and we've, we've come up with all sorts of scenarios, as you see in this report, in terms of not getting any funding, getting some funding, uh, doing what option four has been recommended. So I do believe it's time for a summit. I think it's uh, certainly time to sit down and talk with, uh, with the senior levels of government about the impact that it's having uh, on our community and the long-term impact for our community, because I'll repeat and I'll keep repeating it uh, as long as I'm around, is that there isn't anything more fundamental than water. If you can think of something more fundamental than water, please let me know. And Councillor Greer, it's not beer. So it's, water is pretty fundamental. And uh, depending on how, how this is gonna go, uh, there may be a discussion later on down the road about what the cost is going to be, and, and maybe that cost will be higher than we like it to be. But remember that we're doing something that has been ordered, uh, directed for us to do. It's not a ch we didn't have a choice. We, uh, we, weren't, uh, we weren't asked to negotiate. We weren't told that we could negotiate. We were told what to do. This is the level of water quality you will have, and that's it, period. And this is, this is the deadline that you have. That's it, period. So we now know how much it's going to cost. We now know all the breakdown of those costs. And um, I, I do certainly believe it's time for what I call, for lack of a better term, some, some form of a summit meeting with, uh, with the senior levels of government to go over this in great detail and give them all of the, all of the options that we looked at. And uh, I know that we have the qualified staff to do that. Uh, if anybody has ever done a project with due diligence, this is one of them. And I'm extremely proud of, of the work that staff, that staff have done and continue to do. So that's my, that's my take.
Before I go to anybody else, I just want to jump in because there are a couple other updates. So I have been in, in constant communication actually with our MLA and she is uh, working on our behalf to determine with the Ministry of Health if there's a possibility for a delay in that date and she's also looking obviously at the funding side of it. Uh, I've been talking with a colleague, a uh, friend of mine in Manitoba, faced with the very same situation. Uh, they're also in the same boat, have projects, no funding, no process. Uh, it's not unique to BC or even unique to our area by any stretch of the imagination. It's occurring right now clear across the country. Uh, last uh, month, the FCM did pass an emergency resolution urging the federal government to get the what they're calling framework agreements in place with the provinces. It's through those framework agreements that the processes ultimately are determined for us to then apply. That's what's missing here. But I also want to point out, no one said at the federal level or at the provincial level that we're not going to get any funding. This isn't a question of whether we should or shouldn't get funding. It's a question of getting the processes in place. Unfortunately, it's very late. Uh, and then ultimately making those determinations. And I have every confidence that we will receive both a federal and a provincial significant grant toward this project as our uh, com our friends down in Nanaimo recently did, well, last year with their water treatment plant. However, um, it's a question of timing, and we don't know exactly when that can occur. So uh, I think we need to apply as much pressure as we can and continue to work with the UBCM and, and our uh, organizations to continue to press. And I know the province is working to get agreements in place now with the feds, and I believe there are at least eight other provinces that don't have any of these agreements in place. And, uh, and hopefully we will have a, a much more positive answer soon. Any further discussion from members of council? I'll go with Councillor Paul Davidson and Councillor Newfeld. Thank you, thank you, Your Worship. Um, a question for you. I realize that um, you know the Minister of Health and and all the other um, levels of government that we need to approach. But I'm just wondering, is there any? any value in copying Island Health? Because throughout this report where we see that this is a directive from Island Health, should they not be kept um, at least in the loop as to our dilemma and, and in, include them in some of the communications or are you doing that via another means? I suspect they probably are at a staff level, but I know our MLA is dealing directly with the Minister of Health. Councillor Newfeld. Thanks, your, uh, thanks very much, Your Worship. The question that I have is with respect to uh, timing of referendum. If, if uh, uh, we don't receive any uh, positive feedback as far as uh, what we're expecting uh, within the next uh, six weeks or whatever, um, we will in fact have the opportunity to go back and, and look at uh, having a referendum in, in the fall with the, the election. Uh, if we have uh, some indication that uh, we, we have the possibility of, of uh, monies and this type of thing, uh, but in fact, we still have to go back and, and get somewhere like uh, six, eight, ten, twelve thousand, a million. Uh, when, when, in fact, uh, would that referendum? When would a referendum be possible as far as that loan uh, uh, authorization is concerned? How would that work out? So, if we don't know by August 5th, or we don't make a decision by August 5th, so we may have to, for instance, call the special council meeting just for that. Um, we would not be in time to have a question on the actual ballot in November, uh, whatever the parameters may be. We could, uh, say August 4th, decide as a council to go with option 4, for instance, which is in here, and it would be a question on the ballot. Um, after that date, uh, it is not impossible uh, for the next uh, council to go ahead and set a date. You don't have to obviously have a referendum during the time of an election. You tend to do that because it's obviously less expensive. It's about a thirty or forty thousand dollar cost just to have the referendum and they even have they even have an option of a counter petition as well if that was something the next council were wanting to do. Uh, so it's kind of a hard question to answer, but uh, I would hope that we would at least get some indication one way or the other prior to that date to give us at least a bit more of an informed position to move forward in. Uh, but it's certainly uh, something that we may have to fall back to option for regardless of this, if this is what Council ultimately adopts. If I could have a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so in fact, uh, what, what, what happened, uh, Your Worship, is that uh, uh, if, if, we, if no decision was taken, uh, in fact, the, the new Council in the new year uh, would be able to, uh, you know, at the discretion of, of that council, uh, be willing to spend $30,000 or whatever the uh, referendum would be, uh, whatever the cost would be, to in fact look at, at uh, um, the, the amount of money that would have to be required from our taxpayers. And, and they would be able to do that you know, in the new year. Uh, and that would not be a constraint. Uh, there would be no uh, concern there as far as uh, 
um, official ability to uh, actually hold a referendum? No, no, not at all. They can certainly do that. Any long-term borrowing, uh, it's a requirement, and, and council could certainly do that. I think the concern comes with that hard deadline, which is when the new standard comes into place. So, uh, and we've been working on a critical path for quite a number of years, and it's all geared around that deadline. Now, in a normal circumstance, we would have had our answer in March. March, we would have known exactly where we stood in terms of the federal and provincial funding components. That has been always the case, and we've applied for many, many uh, large infrastructure projects and small alike. Um, that's obviously not the case this year, and here we are in July, and, and we still don't even have a process to apply through. So um, the big issue is that date. If we ultimately end up in a situation where we can't bring um, the necessary uh, treatment filtration online for that deadline, and the health authority has not relaxed, or say the Minister of Health has not ordered an additional delay so that we can continue to access the, the water from the river, then we're in trouble. Then we're in really serious trouble because we're not going to put our, our staff at risk. We're not going to go against the health order. It means we shut down and we have about half of our normal water supply until such time as it's built. I would hope that's not the case. Part of what I will be expressing in these letters on our behalf is exactly how important it is that we have an answer very quickly and the potential, as you saw very well laid out in that report, not just uh, economic with general ramifications to our community if we don't get this in place. This isn't rocket science. This is straightforward stuff and this is the federal government's job, right, to return some of those dollars back to us. It's been going that way every year for a long time. So um, that is the intent uh, in this and we'll do it in a, you know, diplomatic but very strong terms that we need to have answers very quickly here. I'm being given all kinds of uh, different answers from different people and some have even suggested the money's there just go ahead and apply so let's just go ahead and apply direct to the direct to the damn prime minister if necessary and see where we fall out and see exactly what money is available and where there are some projects that are being funded in different parts of the country and there's some four billion dollars that uh, I'm told is entirely in the hands of the federal government in terms of where that funding goes independent of any process but unfortunately the criteria listed for that amount of money uh, excludes water systems so uh, we just need further clarification and quickly. Comments from members of council? So on the motion as presented, all those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, Mrs. Thomas, can you give us the background with respect to the Parksville Downtown Business Improvement Area petition, please? Uh, yes, Your Worship. The City of Parksville, on behalf of the Parksville Downtown Business Association, recently undertook a petition process to determine the level of support for renewal of the Parksville Downtown Business Improvement Area and related tax revenues required to fund PDBA activities. Um, the process was conducted in accordance with the Community Charter Act of BC. A total of 249 petitions were distributed. Of those, 49 petitions were returned. Of the petitions returned, 24 were determined to be sufficient and valid, in other words, opposing renewal of the, of the BIA. This does not meet the 50% threshold uh, 125, which is required by the Community Charter. And therefore, I am certifying that sufficient petitions have not been received in relation to renewal of the Parksville Downtown Business Improvement Area. And Council may therefore proceed with renewing the improvement area for the term of January 1st, 2015 through December 31st, 2019. All right, thank you. So we have a motion to receive, moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Paul Davidson. Any discussion? Being none, all in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Thank you. All right, next item, of course, was removed from the agenda. Moving on now, Mr. Manson, this is item K. Ladies and gentlemen, can you give us the background with respect to our 2013 annual municipal report? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, it's not going to be much of a verbal report as outlined in the agenda. Uh, the community ch charter requires uh, municipalities to um, publish their annual report uh, out Finding the objectives and measures established for that year and how we uh, met them, which is uh, what's outlined in the report uh, for Council and the public's review. 
So we're looking for a motion to receive. Moved by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Morrison. Discussion? Councillor Powell-Davidson. Thank you, Worship. I'm afraid I'm lost. Are we on 7A? We are on item 6K. H-I-J-5. I don't have it. We're just receiving a report, so it's not critical. You can always read it after we've received it. Okay. okay. Sorry, Your Worship, I um, had my papers picked up Thursday night, and there was a final change that you all had. I didn't get it. Ah, okay. So, uh, again, though, this is a motion to receive, so um, you know we're not giving any direction here other than to receive it. Any other member of council have anything to add? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are now moving into bylaws, which is section seven, and we have three bylaws up for first reading tonight, and we have a recommendation to uh, read all three uh, first time. Uh, do we have a mover and a seconder for that recommendation? Moved by Councillor Weir, seconded by Councillor Morrison. Uh, these are the Plan Parcel Amendment Bylaw 2014, number 1492.1, the Housing Agreement Authorization Bylaw, the Zoning and Development Amendment Bylaw 2014, number 2000.95. Does any member of council wish to speak to any one of those independently? Does any member of council wish to um, object to any one of those independently? All right, so seeing no hands, I'm going to call it. All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. <coughs> Moving on to item B, and that's uh, one bylaw for two readings and advancement to a public hearing, and this is regarding Zoning and Development Amendment Bylaw 2014, number 2000.93. We have a recommendation to that effect. Moved by Councillor Fave, seconded by Councillor Powell-Davidson. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. And uh, now moving to C, which is rescind second reading, read as amended and advance to public hearing, and that's one bylaw, uh, and that's regarding zoning and development amendment bylaw 2014, number 2000.91. And we have a three part recommendation to do just that. And uh, looking for a mover and a seconder, moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Greer. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Moving on to item D, and these are up for three readings, and uh, we have three of those bylaws, and the appropriate recommendation for all three, and that's the Downtown Business Improvement Area Establishment Bylaw, the Sign Bylaw, and the Loan Authorization. Actually, you know what, we have to modify that, so this is going to be two, up for two, uh, two bylaws for three readings tonight, and that's bylaw one and two, excluding bylaw three, since we've already passed that motion. And do I have a mover and a seconder? Moved by Councillor Fave and seconded by Councillor Greer. Any discussion on either of those two items? All right, any objection to either of those two items? All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. All right, going on to item E, we have one bylaw for third reading tonight, and that's only a development amendment bylaw 2014, number 2000.92. I have a recommendation to that effect. Moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Greer. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Thank you. And now into F, final adoption. We have three bylaws for final adoption this evening. It's the election procedures and automated vote counting authorization bylaw, the Parksville advanced voting opportunities bylaw, and the Parksville special voting opportunities bylaw. We have a recommendation for all three. We have a mover and a seconder moved by Councillor Paul Davidson, seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. Any discussion? <coughs> all those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Thank you. Look at that, ladies and gentlemen, we're already into new business. Does any member of council have any new business this evening? Councillor Powell-Davidson. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just two quick things. I had the occasion to speak to the parcel newcomers last week. It was a great group, and we talked about all the wonderful things there are to do in Parksville. Um, they, uh, Many of them have moved from all over this country, certainly all over this province, to be in our lovely city. And um, one of the 
most wonderful comments I heard was from their president who had attended our Canada Day celebrations down in the community park put on by Parksville Rotary. And he said he'd lived in pretty much everywhere all over this country and he'd never seen Canada Day celebrations like that. So I want to uh, put a shout out to the organizers of Parksville's Canada Day. I, it was a great, great day and they did a fabulous job, all volunteers, so thank you to them. Thank you. And just a quick follow-up, I did have a call from the police chief the day after, as is a tradition, to let me know about how many of you misbehaved at the, at the events, and none of you really did. He was quite impressed. He said they had a very easy go of it. Uh, very, very happy, uh, go lucky, real family-orientated crowd, so it's, it's been a real success. Other members of council, new business. All right, so let's just move along because we do have some special business this evening, ladies and gentlemen. I need a motion that pursuant to section 91C of the community charter, council proceed to a closed meeting to consider an item related to labor relations. Moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Paul Davidson. All in favor, opposed, carried. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We're going into a special meeting and uh, you do have a beautiful evening remaining. <laughs>